Greetings, everyone. My name is uh, Karen Catasquillo. I am the Senior Vice President of Clinical and Professional Affairs at Boston Site. And I would like to welcome you all to our uh, Boston Site Sclero Practitioner Learning Series featuring tonight a webinar titled, How to Get Started with Boston Site Sclero, Get the Most Out of Your Fit Kit. With us tonight, we have two brilliant, esteemed, uh, and expert clinicians and KOLs. We have Dr. Suzanne Sherman and Dr. Steve Sorkin. Just, you know, as a matter of a little bit of background, for those of you who may not know, uh, these two um, amazing uh, KOLs, I think most of you by now would know them, but just as a matter of a little bit of background, Dr. Sorkin is Director of Specialty Contact Lens Services at Cornell Associates of New Jersey and Fairfield, New Jersey. He earned his Doctor of Optometry degree from the State University of New York College of Optometry. He participates in many contact lens related studies, lectures extensively throughout the country and internationally on contact lenses, dry eyes, ocular allergies, ocular therapeutics, and corneal disease. He has a special interest in difficult to fit contact lens patients, such as those that we're gonna be speaking tonight, like keratoconus and post-surgical cases, and manages patients with complex anterior segment conditions. He also currently serves as the president of the Essex County Optometric Society, and is a member of the board of directors of the New Jersey Society of Optometric Physicians. He is a fellow of the Scarlet Lens Education Society and a junk faculty at Salus University. He was actually also named New Jersey Optometrist of the Year in 2018 by the New Jersey Society of Optometric Physicians. Dr. Suzanne Sherman is Assistant Professor of Optometric Sciences and Ophthalmology and Director of Optometri Optometric Services at Columbia University Irvine Medical Center. She specializes in complex and medically necessary contact lens fittings anterior segment disease and primary care. She received her undergrad degree from the University of Michigan with a degree in brain behavior and cognitive science. She graduated from SUNY College of Optometry and was elected to the Beta Sigma Kappa International Optometric Honor Society. She completed her optometric residency in ocular disease and primary care at Bronze Le Lebanon Hospital Center. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a fellow of the Sclera Lens Education Society. She is dedicated to research and has contributed to peer reviewed scientific journals, um, such as a Review of Optometry, Optometric Vision Science. Um, she is also uh, presented in many annual meetings, such as the American Academy of Optometry and the Global Specialty Lens Symposium. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Steve Sorkin. And while I um, transfer this to um, our presentation to presenter mode, um, I'm just gonna let you guys know that towards the end, we will have an opportunity to answer any questions you may have. So if you have any questions, please feel free to direct them through the Q&A panel. And if we have time at the end, as your moderator tonight, we'll try to get to most, if not all of your questions. So without further ado, Dr. Sorkin, please take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Karaskio, and thank you for, to Boston Site. And it's an honor to lecture again with my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Sherman. So I'm gonna get things started. We'll talk about obviously Boston Site lenses and scleral lenses, which is a big passion of mine. I spend a majority of my clinical day dealing with cornea and specialty contact lenses and scleral lenses being a big part of that. And Boston Site uh, scleral came out about five years ago, I believe, and it's become a very integral part of my specialty lens practice. Um, so the original Boston Site scleral came out again about five years ago with a very large diameter, the 18, 18, 5, and 19, 0. And we really went to this as our go-to lens for very diseased corneas. Uh, very challenging cases. It became really uh, the go-to lens for those type of conditions. But more recently, Boston Site has expanded their horizons a little bit and gone to also having a, a smaller diameter, which is the 16, 65, and 17 -0. So we'll go ahead and talk about those uh, you know, two different categories of lenses and how they play a role in 
to, taking care of all of our specialty lens uh, cornea challenging patients. So uh, we'll go through that, uh, you know, during the, the process of this talk. And also we'll, we'll touch on a little bit about the SMART360, which is the free form and more recent development and kind of where scleral lenses are going. Next slide, please. Okay. So we're gonna to touch on now what makes Boston Sight Scleral so special, that it has many built-in features that allows you to be uh, very precise and very successful in fitting a lot of these types of patients. So really, uh, the knowledge and experience that goes into the design of these lenses, the ability to customize the lens as you need to, makes for a very, very successful type of lens. Next slide, please. Okay. The real amazing thing about Boston's Iscleral is that when they did the original data for the uh, lenses, they found, and we found that there is definitely a difference in anatomical shape between the right eye and the left eye, and that has to do with EOM insertion and just the overall shape of the sclera. So when we're fitting sclera lenses, of course, we are fitting the sclera as well as the cornea. So the, the data has gone into this design has allowed uh, us to be able to do you know, a more specific right and left. So I believe it's the only sclera lens design that I know of that actually uh, addresses this difference. So when you're putting a right lens in versus a left lens is obviously very critical because there's definitely differences in how that lens is going to perform on the eye. So when you look at the fitting set, and Dr. Sherman will go over that in a few slides, uh, you'll see that there is a right side and a left side, and all the lenses are marked R and L. So this is a very critical um, uh, part of the design and fitting process, and it's very important that you uh, stick to the right eye or left eye. Next slide. So one of the other main things that Boston Sight has allowed us to do is do quad specific haptics. So the lenses that you get in the fitting set, all the lenses already have built in quadrant haptics. A lot of designs will come with toric haptics, but this has built in quad haptics. So there'll be a one, two, three, and four marked on every lens um, that'll orient you on which particular area you need to address. So you can address those all together or independently, which makes it a very customizable design. Okay, so quadrant specific is built in, it's automatic, and that's the way the lens is, uh, is designed. Uh, next. And the other thing that's been added in more recently is having oval optic zones. We know that the corneas are not round, they're oval. Um, so the idea of having a more customized design built into the lens allows for better stability and improved centration, and also allows for uh, the ability to uh, eliminate certain things like contractile prolapse and certain types of centration issues that can happen with, with uh, you know, other designs. Okay, next slide, please. And um, here's another really exciting area of uh, uh, vision correction part with the Boston Sight Scleral. We talked about the fitting characteristics, but also the other part that makes Boston Sight Scleral shine is the ability to have built-in eccentricity. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on, particularly in my cases at all. So if you look at the two different uh, visual acuity charts there on the bottom, uh, courtesy of uh, Dr. Gomez, on the left there is just a, uh, a, just a traditional uh, scleral lens and you can see all the ghosting and coma with that lens. 90% of the fits achieve optimal vision with the built-in front surface eccentricity. And there's zero, one, and two which we'll go over a little bit later on. But you can see the increase in quality and that's built into the lens. There's nothing that you specifically need to do. So it does improve a quality vision. My case that I'll show you later on was just like this. We had a patient that was wearing a star lens from another office. We, we refit them into the Boston site lens and they had a significantly improved, number one, they saw it better on the chart, but, but number two, more specifically, they said that their quality vision had never been better. So we really can change the lives of our patients and sometimes doing things like changing the eccentricity can be very effective in, um, in, in changing that uh, quality of vision. Next slide, please. And this is really another exciting area that's happening um, in scleral lenses, and that's the ability to customize the lens and incorporate higher order aberration correction. So this is uh, something that is, um, being discussed and studied, and Boston Sight has the ability now to incorporate these type of corrections into the scleral lens, and that's called the Smart Sight HOA. And that's not in the original fitting set, that's a little bit more 
advanced. Um, next slide, please. Another design feature that's been added to the Boston Sight lens is the ability to add what we call channels or smart channels. And that's, a, that's an area that you can add to the uh, periphery of the lens that will allow increased uh, tear flow under, and, uh, under the lens itself. So it, number one will allow uh, certain, what I call speed bumps, which is like Pinguecula's, Pterygia's, or Salzman's nodules, things like that, where you can basically you know, leap over those areas and um, make the lens more comfortable and less uh, issues with physiology. And the other part is to reduce suction. So we have patients, particularly those who, let's say you have a corneal transplant and you wanna have more tear exchange or allow the lens to not suction onto the eye quite as uh, readily, this um, smart channel allows you to do that. So really the main thing we're doing is promoting tear exchange and also improving the, both the, um, the quality of uh, comfort for the patient, as well as also the visible you know, redness and irritation and injection that can happen with um, lenses that do not have the smart channels. So this is another added feature that's available with the Boston Sight Spiral. Next slide. And then another area that is uh, very exciting now is the ability to measure and quantify the, not only the cornea, but also the scleral with scleral topography. So there are two different uh, versions, uh, the Eaglet and the Oculus Penicam CSP, and those things can be incorporated into your practice, and they allow you to do what I, I, I said before, which is more of a freeform design, which is even a more customized lens uh, rather than doing diagnostic lenses. So this is available in 16 to 19 millimeter diameters. Okay, next slide, please. And what's really nice about uh, the Boston site people is that you have the ability to connect with consultation and also the ability to uh, order lenses and check on the status of lenses online, which is what's called Fit Connect. So if you have an account with Boston site, they'll set you up with this and you can go online. And it's really nice because you can uh, customize the lenses, make changes, there's uh, ways to do it. Um, and then if you do need consultation, of course, you have that ability. So you can do things like design lenses using uh, graphical analysis, place orders, track shipments. You can check your invoices, check your bills, uh, print prescriptions. So uh, it's really helpful. I find that it's great to be able to do that online, saves time, and uh, it's very easy to, to access as well. And Boston Site has recently changed their warranty period as a point to 100. 120 days. So it's unlimited returns within 120 days. So if you do have a very difficult fit or you're just getting started, you feel like you need that extra time, it's really great to have a four month uh, window to be able to make adjustments and changes. So that's very helpful. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is just a graphical analysis, uh, um, actually, a, a representation um, where when you do go onto the Fit Connect, uh, obviously you can. Um, send notes to the laboratory people and they will go ahead and take that information and that's called um, hold for consultation. So you just click on that area there and it's very helpful and they will contact you to go over the case or you can call them by phone, obviously. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so these are the superstars behind the scenes um, and we have Chris uh, Mickelson on the line. He's the newest member of the team. Um, and Manny is the uh, in charge of the lab itself. So these are really uh, great people to have um, on your side if you do need help, um, either via email um, or you can call into the lab itself. So um, always utilize your consultants and Boston Site has a great team, like I said. So um, you know, if you do have a question, they can walk you through uh, what you need. You can email them uh, you know, uh, scans or photos, videos, and also to you know, just to discuss the case if you need to. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, hand it over now to Dr. Sherman. She's gonna go take it away. Thank you, Dr. Sherman. So first of all, um, thank you to uh, Boston Site for having me and to Karen and Steve, two of my mentors. Um, it's really an honor. And to see 70 of you on here tonight, it's what, Tuesday night, eight o'clock. I'm impressed. Hope your kids are sleeping. You've got nice drink, cold beverage. And actually, as I scroll through the list of participants here, um, it's kind of fun. We have people from Ecuador. I see old 
classmates, some very good friends who I've lectured with. And I have to give a shout out to my own father who has decided to participate, even though he is not an optometrist, ophthalmologist, contact lens fitter, more of an OBGYN. So thanks, Dad. Um, so we're going to get started. I really liked this graphic because uh, when it comes to scleral contact lenses, we think of bowls, right? And so we have the fish and which, which size is the right size. And I think the key to Boston Sight and specifically this scleral lens they've created is that it's really intuitive. Um, and they've taken a lot of the complex decisions out of it. And they've really given you such a sturdy um, data-driven lens that you can fly. Um, so we're going to walk through where you would start if you're new to the fit or if you've been fitting for a while, but you're new to Boston site. So there's two different fitting sets now. Um, and when I first started fitting this five years or so ago, we didn't have this. So this is really exciting. Just in two separate sets, you have diameters from 16 millimeters all the way to 19. Um, and what I would say is that if you don't have a lot of sets at, in your practice or you're just getting started, you don't need much more than this to at least get started. Um, one set has 16 millimeters, 16, five and 17, and the other has 18, 18, five and 19. And that really covers almost all of your bases. Um, I know Steve very well, and he, I know he has fit some smaller lenses than this. And I myself in my practice have some larger than this. But this is a wonderful, very um, well-rounded place to begin. So starting with the 16, 16, 5, 17, who are the patients you're going to put these uh, lenses on? You know, uh, one, one thing that people use is HVID, horizontal visible iris diameter. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, you haven't measured that before, it, any conference you go to, they will give you multiple of these rulers. I used to shove my pockets as a student, anything free, right? Um, so you can pick those up. Um, you also, when you do a pentacam or any kind of topography or slit lamp camera, you actually can measure the iris diameter on there. Um, so the suggestion is less than 11 millimeters. Small apertures, tight or taut lids, um, regular corneas of pediatric patients and um, difficulty patients who have poor dexterity or a large lens would seem difficult. Um, this is a good place to start. Um, when I start first started fitting lenses, um, a colleague of mine actually suggested, you know, you turn the patient to the side and you with your own fingers, you kind of open up their eye. That gives you an idea of how taut the lens is and how wide their aperture is. And the larger ones, 18, 18, 5, 19, um, larger HVIDs, 11.5 or larger, compromised ocular surface. You know, that makes sense. You want to cover as much of that surface as possible. A highly ectatic cornea. You know, if you think about having to climb over a hill, um, if you have to get much higher up, um, the landing won't be as steep if you have a larger surface area to come down on. Chronic exposure, we want every area of the eye covered. Um, compromised or fragile grafts. You might not think that that's a large diameter lens, but in these patients, we often want a really loose fitting lens. So there's really no suction when the, when the lens comes off. And severe dry eye, similar to the other ocular surface uh, disease ones, we want to cover the ocular surface to the, to the maximum capacity. So when you get your fitting set, this is a very simplified version of their algorithm. And as uh, Steve said, we have one for the right eye and one for the left eye. And I can't tell you the number of times before I got this set that I either had to take the lens off a patient's right eye to put it on the left eye because I wanted the same lens for both eyes, or I had to compromise in going up and down or not the exact lens I wanted because I needed the exact same lens for both eyes. So here we go. We have a set that has a right and a left, which is really wonderful because they've taken into account um, the extraocular muscles and the ways that our lenses decenter. We know they decenter temporally and slightly down. Um, and this has all been put into these lenses. So when you open your set, regardless of the diameter, you're first gonna start with your standard lens. And, and this is the light blue kind of teal center um, dot here. Um, and every lens on that, that uh, horizontal lane will all be the same sagittal height. And you're able to pivot based off what you see when you've put that first lens on. So if the lens is too loose, you can move to the right. 
um, and go to a steeper uh, distribution, which means the edges would be steeper, but the sag stays the same. And if I've learned anything in the last, uh, you know, almost decade of practicing is that I like to make one change at a time, because if you make more than one change, you either create a problem and you don't know what caused it, or um, you fix a problem and you don't know what fixed the problem. So the nice thing is this lens just changes the edges, um, or if the lens is too tight, you can make it looser by making your edges flatter. So this is a very simplified version of what you will see in your fitting set. Um, and if you're just starting, this is a great place to just pinpoint in the center, and then you know to move to the right or to the left. So this is a, a setup of what the fitting set would look like. And this is just one eye. And this happens to be the larger diameter fitting set. So the 19, the 18.5, and 18.0. And what I will tell you is that I often start at standard um, and I don't usually end up pivoting to the right or to the left at this point. Um, and that's because based on what I see from the standard lens, I know if the sag looks good and I know if I see flat or steep edges and I know what I'm gonna change without having to take off that lens and put another one on. However, in the beginning, when you first get this set, this is a really great way to teach yourself either on a colleague or a technician is just move up and move down, excuse me, move right or left and see how the edges change. Um, but you see that the sag stays the same. So you're only changing one parameter um, and this makes it so you can really observe what happens when you change the haptics. Now, the other thing on this fitting set you'll see is that there also is a steeper sag. So you can have even more clearance and it goes up to 3.4 sag and that's to the right. Um, and why is this really important? Um, from getting burned multiple times, I'll tell you that it is much easier if you have too much clearance to know how much to bring the lens down. Why? We know lenses are around 300 microns thick. Um, so we can compare that to the tear film and you can make an educated decision on how to change your fit. But when you fit a lens and you're touching, it's really, really hard to know how much you have to increase that lens in order to clear the cornea. So I have countless times called Manny um, and said, what do you think? This many, this many. And, and together we try to make an educated decision. And I will tell you, sometimes we do wonderful and sometimes we don't. Um, and you'll have to see with your own comfort level. I'm at a place where if there's a tiny bit of touch, I will often let the patient go home with it and mail them a new lens. But that's why Boston Sight has created it so that you can always move up. Um, and, but you're not really moving down because um, you always want to be fully clearing it. Now we're going to move to this gray box on the side here. And this is something that Steve mentioned. This is uh, really um, incredible technology. And this is front surfaced eccentricity. And you have options here. Um, in my practice, I probably will tell you nine out of 10 times I don't utilize this. Now, maybe I'm underutilizing it. Um, and that's because um, the lens is so good <laughs> that I, I feel it's not always necessary. But when you do utilize it, it's, it's really exciting. And we use this when we have a patient that we either refracted or often in my practice, I'll throw an RGP, a corneal RGP on, and you, you expect better vision than you got in the scleral lens. So if the patient has an irregular cornea um, and the initial lens you put on, it's a uh, front, uh, front surface eccentricity of one, you would go to the FSE two. That's the recommended um, change. And if it improves the vision, then you will order your lens with FSE2 on it. Now, if you look at the numbers, um, the sag is the higher sag there, um, and the curvature is going with the standard curve. I mean, the, the landing is standard. So those are little things to keep in mind. Now, if you're fitting a normal cornea, someone who just has dry eye, and again, you're kind of wondering why is the vision not better than it should be, you would go to an SE0. And the nice thing is you have these lenses in your fitting set, so you can always throw them on and see if you get improvement or not. And I think we have a little video now that you can actually see um, where online in, uh, in, the, in the Fit Connect, you can actually make these parameter changes. So the person is ordering, they're putting in their prescription power, and then if they had cylinder and axes, but here they says smart site FSE and you pick one, two, or three. Um, if you're not changing it, it automatically defaults to FSE1. 
So what's the benefit of having this wide range of data and driven diameters with built-in scleral shape? Um, I would tell you the benefit, I think, is that, uh, in my, my opinion, sometimes mostly less is more. And what I've learned is less manipulation um, is beneficial, and especially when you have a really smart, smart lens. Um, but also they have something called a uh, smart 360. And if you're lucky enough to have an eaglet or a surface profile or the Oculus CSP, um, you can do this in a design free form using a 360 scan of the eye. I haven't had the privilege of doing that, but I have some colleagues who have and, and really enjoy it. Right. So, you know, what, what's the benefit of this? We know our patients really well. And the more you get to know your lenses, the, you will know what the best lens for them is, and you'll know how to walk them through them. And with the different parameters and the different SAGs, you're able to kind of move around um, in a way that benefits your patient. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of my patients. Um, and I want to give this disclaimer. These patients, while when you see the case and what they actually have, the underlying pathology and disease seems very complex and severe and might not be the kind of patient you have in your chair. However, the fit is not. Um, so it's easy to be intimidated in the beginning by the underlying pathology, but the actual act of fitting and benefiting the patient um, is something everyone can handle. So this is a patient who has CPEO. Um, this is a mitochondrial disease and uh, they have severe ptosis. You can see on the left, they, they really, you can't see their pupillary reflex. Um, this is a 20 year old girl, 2020 vision in both eyes, has tried ptosis crutches, has tried taping her lids, but she has severe dry eye. With CPEO, you often cannot move your eye muscles. So your eyes are fixed in place. And so she can't block her eyes from wind or shield. So we actually um, used the diagnosis of keratoconjunctivitis sica to submit to her insurance, and she was cleared for scleral contacts. And I knew in this case, I wanted a large diameter lens. Why? I wanted to cover the largest surface area of the eye. Also, I knew that this was a healthy cornea, and I had the ability to put excessive amount of central clearance to get the lids to rest on the, uh, on the lens. So um, I can manipulate the amount of central clearance um, to make the, le the lens even further from the cornea to get the eyelids open. And you see here, she has about a three millimeter improvement. She's now been wearing these lenses for three to four years. Um, she does wear glasses on top. This was a first lens uh, fit that worked perfectly. She saw well. We didn't change it for about two years until we even made it uh, more clearance so that her lids were up even more. Um, and this has been a huge quality of life change, but not something that took a tremendous amount of my chair time. It was really incredible. Uh, this is another patient of mine. I actually saw him today. He's, he's lovely. He had squamous cell carcinoma of the maxillary sinus orbit, skin of the left cheek. Um, this has left him with lag ophthalmos of the lower lid, and he also had radiation therapy. I have a good amount of patients who have had radiation as we have ocular oncology at Columbia. Um, and these patients have severe ocular surface disease. His case, he really just, the eye doesn't close at all. And when he came to see me in probably 2018, 2017, he had tried every bandage contact lens possible. Um, and this is a case where I started with an 18 millimeter lens. And at the time, that's the only one I had from Boston site. Um, and it, I let him go get a coffee with his wife and he had such tremendous relief that I actually let him take this lens home with him that day. Um, and over time, we increased the diameter of the lens to cover even more surface area to 19 millimeters. I do note that he has a subconch heme in this picture that is not from his lens. This just happened to be um, the one we captured. And in his case, he's unusual in that with the clearance of his ocular oncologist, we actually have him in a scleral lens, large diameter, 23 hours a day. So he has two separate lenses. He alternates day time and night time. Um, and I saw him today. He's been wearing about four years straight and he's doing phenomenal. His vision is 2020. The cornea looks pristine um, and he is has no reoccurrences, which is really incredible. Dr. Sherman, just a quick question sure. about that. What uh, was the uh, scleral shape that you actually um, used to fit uh, this patient out of the standard steep or flat? So in this, so I'll tell you in my, 
my opinion only. Um, when I first started fitting, I did a lot of small and tight lenses and I have evolved a lot in that now I do a lot of large and loose lenses. So I almost never start steep. I always start standard or loose. And the reason is a lot of my patients are ocular surface disease patients. And I want, um, I don't want any suction um, when the lens is removed. So, and him, I put a standard on um, and over time we may have uh, loosened the edges. Well, that's great. That's good to know. So, I mean, in a way the standard is to go to, so that's great to know. Thank you. Yeah. I've also, at this point, I, I don't want to, I don't want to spend, I want to spend chair time with my patient, but not changing lenses over and over. So the standard gives me the ability to know if I need to move right or left. Um, and I like that. Wonderful. Thanks. And this is just a side view. You see his lower lid really is not, um, and this is a young guy. Um, and you see that he's already been through extremely traumatic surgery and his, his face is severely disfigured. And before he was wearing a patch all the time and he's in hospitality. So this is a life-changing um, medical device that from a fitting perspective was actually fairly easy, um, but could have seemed really intimidating. Uh, this is another patient of mine and, and those on the call or Steve will tell you, I'm a big, bigger is better kind of person at this point. I did not start that way, but this is the case where a small lens really um, can, can do a lot of good. This is another patient of mine with basal cell carcinoma of her left eyelid. And you can see, if you look closely, she has these dagger trachiasis lashes coming down. Um, she's had a skin graft. She has Salzman's nodules from the area just being chronically exposed which led her to get a herpetic infection. Um, and she, but she still has about 20, 30 vision. She had tried multiple bandage contact lenses. So when I looked at her, you know, even though my normal reaction is go big, um, I said, hmm, I don't think that's a great idea this time for a couple of reasons. One, you see the area where it almost looks like she has a simple left ron, the, the conge and the, and the, the lid have really kind of grown together. Two, you see her lids are taut, they're uncomfortable looking, they're angry. Um, she's gonna have to be using her fingers to, uh, to manipulate them to get a lens in. So in this case, I ended up going smaller. And for me, smaller is 17 millimeters. Um, and this is another case where we did a 17 millimeter lens because it covered almost her entire ocular surface and did not interfere with the simple efferon area. Um, and she is now wearing the lens about 14 hours a day. And she will be uh, another patient that's using it twice, two different lenses, one for during the day and one for at night. Um, but it is another patient of mine where I really did not have to do tremendous manipulation in order to get the lens to fit well and for the patient to have good comfort. Ooh, I think it's my turn. <laughs> All right. So thank you, Dr. Sherman. Wonderful cases. Um, now I'm going to go over a few of my cases. And um, let's start with, and I echo what Suzanne had said, you know, we're going to show you some cases that are pretty challenging possibly, but I want to demonstrate the well, number one, the utilization of scar lenses in general, but specifically the Boston sight lens. Um, to allow us to fit these patients effectively and quickly without having to make multiple lens changes orders. Um, so just the, the straightforward nature of the fitting set and how to, uh, how to uh, incorporate what you need to uh, with minimal changes. So this is my first case that I'm going to discuss with you is a patient of mine who uh, was referred by a cornea surgeon. He uh, was doing some uh, work around his house. He was decided to pull off some uh, some siding off of his house and nail flew right into his cornea. And uh, being like a retired fireman, he decided to try to pull the nail out himself. And once he started seeing a you know, fluid draining down his cheek, he decided to go to the ER and uh, the cornea service there, you know, patched him up and he ended up um, having a, a, a huge full thickness laceration. So uh, full and a ruptured globe. So thankfully the retina was intact. They, they had to uh, remove his, his lens, he, you know, uh, aphakic. So he came to see me about six months after the accident, wanting to be, um, you know, fit with a scleral lens. So you can see that he was 2400. He penned almost about 2060, being aphakic. Left eye, he had a mild cataract. Um, that's just topography there. You see that 
very irregular cornea. Um, so so uh, this is very, you know, obviously a very challenging case. Uh, next slide. So that's uh, just photographs of his laceration. You can still see there are four sutures still in place in the center of the cornea. So I looked at this and said, wow, we need to go to a large lens. We need to clear that area. I don't want anything touching the cornea. A lot of times in aphagic patients, I like to do corneal GP lenses from a physiology standpoint. However, in this case, looking at that cornea, looking at the sutures building there really was not a good idea. A new scleral lens was the way to go. Uh, next slide. So that's just his OCT. You can actually see the sutures, those lines there. You can actually see them. It's right. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, those are the, uh, you know, the sutures still in place. It's got a very regular cornea. You see the laceration went through the cornea itself, and you don't see a lens there in the OCT as well. So we decided to go with a large diameter. I did an 18.5. We did the standard shape and the FSC1. So, of course, we got a huge hyperopic overrefraction, got him to about 2050. Um, we looked at the lens, it was fitting about 350, which we know a scleral lens, of course, is going to settle over time. And I was actually okay with leaving it a little bit um, higher than normal, just because we wanted to stay away from that, um, that those sutures and that, that, uh, that corneal scar that's there. So I looked at it and I said, all right, well, 2050, you know, let's, let's put another lens on. And then we ended up putting on the E2. And look at that, we got from a 2050 to 2040 plus, so almost a two line improvement. So just showing the you know, the quality of vision. Uh, the patient was very motivated at that point. We ordered the lens. You know, we obviously had to be conscious of, we didn't want it too thick of a lens because of the, uh, because of the um, high plus power. So uh, we ordered that lens for him. And next slide. And we ended up having a lens that was 20, a uh, bolt of 300. Everything looked good from a fitting standpoint. We did get a, a plus 0.75 over refraction with the uh, with the, the the first lens we ordered, so I figured let's get him started at least on this lens. Sent him home, ordered the other lens with the plus seventy five. Came in for his uh, follow up visit a couple weeks later. He's doing really well. at wearing lens twelve hours. Cornea looked good, no stain. Uh, very happy, um, and we ended up just switching out the power, and the patient ended up doing really well. So other than a power change, which I consider not really a, a big deal. Um, he ended up doing really well, very successful. So he now can see out of two eyes rather than one, and uh, he's very happy and we're very happy. So nice and straightforward case, um, even though it's a very challenging cornea. So we use a large diameter lens in this case because of the corneal pathology. The idea is a larger lens will clear that area better, stay away from the sutures. And then we have incorporated that FSC2 in a patient that has a compromised cornea and aphakia and that allowed the vision to be improved about two lines from switching from the built-in FSC1, which is the standard um, lens that's uh, used in the fitting kit over the FSC2. And uh, basically we reduced HOAs and improved vision quality and obviously made a huge difference in this patient's life. Okay, I'm gonna move on to an ocular surface case, um, which is a neurotrophic patient. This is a patient that Unfortunately, it had, um, had, had cancer, had multiple radiation treatments, and ended up having a neurotrophic ulcer. Again, cornea had the patient for a while, tried multiple treatments, um, amniotic membranes and oxervate, all kinds of lubrication, steroids, everything. And unfortunately, the patient just could not get healing. So the patient was referred to me for a uh, scleral lens. In addition to her, um, her cancer radiation, she also had eyelid, uh, eyelid keratinization. So she had surgery for that. So not only does she have corneal disease, but she also has eyelid disease. So I looked at this case and said, scleral lenses can be helpful in this, but we're dealing with a patient who's had multiple lid surgeries and radiation. I think going to a smaller lens in this case would be a good idea. Plus she had an HVID of 11.3, which is very much on the small side. Um, there is a topography shown there. Again, with the cornea being the way it is, it's not hugely valuable to us, but it's nice to be able to see what the topography looks like. What we're seeing as we're seeing our back for follow-up visits over the last few months is that that topography is more regular now as her cornea is healing. So she's 2200 in that eye, of course, because of the corneal pathology. Okay, next slide, please. And we use the 16 millimeter, which is on the low end for the Boston site. And I started with the FSC1. She was also a hyperope as well. So she was about a plus four. So it wasn't unusual to get a, you know, a high plus over refraction. We got her to about 2060, 
But again, she's not going to be anywhere near 2020 looking at that cornea. So the idea at this point is more of not only vision correction, but more importantly, it's, it's a treatment of an ocular disease and healing. And that's what a wonderful thing a scleral lens to do, can do. Those of you who, who do scleral lenses now, you know that obviously there's, there, there are life changers that um, not only do we correct vision in a lot of patients, but also we are able to, um, to heal uh, various corneal diseases as well. Okay, so again, we got to about 2050. She also was one of those patients that took at least an hour for her to even get the lens in herself. So my technician and, and extern were extra, you know, extra patient with her, but she was able to do it. She went home with it. She's, and uh, she, she uh, you know, we, we, she left with the lens. We saw her back for a couple of weeks later. Uh, next slide. And uh, again, she, she came back from multiple follow visits. Her cornea looks a whole lot better. The last time I saw her, which was last week, she was down to about 20, 30 minus. So her cornea is healing, she's doing better. And this has been obviously a long-term process. And when you're dealing with these type of patients, it's obviously not just fitting the contact lens, but managing their corneal disease as well. So she's doing well, she's down to 20, 30, she's wearing lens 10 hours a day. We're happy, the cornea specialist is happy and um, she's, she's doing well. She can get the lens in now and you know, one or two tries, no problem. So the idea of using a smaller lens for a patient who, in, in most cases, you go with a larger lens, as Suzanne had said earlier, but sometimes you have to switch gears based on anatomy, based on um, you know, dexterity issues, in her case being you know, smaller aperture with uh, lid, lid condition that, that uh, prevented us from going with a larger lens. So the nice thing to have with the Boston site is now having that smaller lens diameter for these types of patients. And one lens and we were done. Another really straightforward case where we reached for one lens, put it on, and we ordered it, and the patient is doing great. That's amazing, slide, um, Dr. Sorkin. Um, before we go to the next slide, I just wanted to mention there's a few uh, attendees that have been raising their hand, uh, oh, okay. I would imagine, to ask questions, but uh, we'd like to encourage them um, to just uh, write uh, your questions in the Q&A panel, and at the end, uh, hopefully we'll have time to address your questions. Thank you. So let's move to the next slide here. And as I said, small aperture. She also had a small HVID of 11.3. And the idea of having that different, you know, from 16 up to 19 to be able to, um, to handle just about every patient. And this is a, this is a you know, now a keratoconus patient. Let's uh, talk about what we mostly see uh, um, was the patient who has high drops in the other eye, so they're not even interested in doing contact. So she, I inherited her from another practitioner who had, uh, had retired. So he had done some scleral lenses and um, he, he had uh, referred the patient to me. I, I took on her care and she was wearing a scleral lens. She was doing very well. She, her current lens was three years old. She hasn't seen the doc in a while. She was happy with the comfort, but she said, you know, as a lot of our patients do, can you get my vision any better? Especially keratoconus patients are always looking for that perfect 2020 vision where we know a lot of them unfortunately can't get there. But um, she, she was, you know, motivated. She was seeing about 2040 with her current scleral lens and she had a 12.3 HVID. And we said, hey, you know, this lens you have is fine, but there is other options. We have, you know, newer technology now. Let's try this, you know, this Boston Sight lens, which has the ability to uh, address the hydrowater aberrations. Okay, so next slide. And you'll see our topography. This is just a, you know, a, a traditional keratoconus patient. Uh, <laughs> so there we go. So the Ks are, you know, high 50s, low 60s. Again, the 12.3 HVID. So the cornea is on the larger side. So we're definitely thinking of going with a larger diameter lens. So I ended up going with a 19 millimeter lens. And uh, we went with the FSC-1, with this, which is a standard uh, lens that's in the fitting kit. They got just a minus 125 oil refraction. I don't know about you, Suzanne, but a lot of my patients, because of the FSC, um, a lot of patients don't even need a huge over-refraction. I, I think, you know, the, the lenses, you know, maybe one or two diopters in a lot of cases, unless they have, you know, obviously a fake or something like that, a very, very high myopia. I find you don't have to go to very high powers in a lot of cases, which is also very helpful from a physiology standpoint, as well as uh, just a curvature standpoint. I think leaving the lens without doing those high powers 
that allows the, uh, the, the, uh, the vision to be better quality. Um, the tier layer is, is more uniform. So, you know, getting back to this patient, just a minus 125 overfraction, she went from a, I remember 2040 from her previous lens down to a 2030 plus two. And she, you know, the lens fit well as it should. And we ended up, um, ending up getting her about to 2025 with the uh, lens that was ordered. So she did really, really well. And I actually just saw her uh, last week for her six month follow-up. And she said to me, you know, doctor, I'm just so impressed with you. You, you got me fit in one, one lens. She lived an hour and a half away down the Jersey shore. So not like she was around the block and she was just so happy that we were able to fit her in one lens. And number one, she said, um, you know, just the, the, the ease and the smooth smoothness of, of doing this. Plus, she's obviously very appreciative that we we're able to get her her vision quality um, better, which was definitely noticeable for her and for us as well. So, um, another happy uh, patient that we have with Boston Sight lenses. So, I hope some of these cases that we presented today don't scare you off, but make you hopefully get motivated to to uh, if you don't have the fitting set already to get started. If you do have the fitting set and you're not doing a lot of them jump in, um, the, the lens kit is just so intuitive and it just makes it so much more straightforward for you to, you know, just jump in, get started, put some lenses on, get some experience doing it. And Boston site there, you know, the consultation team is available for you. Um, and of course I'm available to you as well. And Karen, uh, if needed as well. Yeah, I have to agree with Steve and what he just said. I, I have a very distinct memory of uh, maybe five or six years ago, um, calling Karen for help on a fit and she FaceTimed me in the middle of the day and she had a pad and she literally was holding the pad like this and she was drawing how the lens moves and changes. And, um, and she had no problem being really uh, selfless with her time. And she also let me come to Boston site and spend a day with her. Um, and, uh, and uh, Manny uh, ha has spent, um, way too many hours on the phone or emailing with me. So I think the support is, is really incredible. And I would also say those of you who have students or like in our practice, we have ophthalmology residents um, and also really educated, smart technicians who um, are NCLE trained. Um, this is a great learning lens because uh, as Steve was saying, you often don't need a huge amount of power um, on the lens. So the effect of the lens is obvious very quickly. You get a lot of wow factor. Um, and a lot of the troubleshooting is, is done for you. So you, you're kind of playing a more simple game because you're using a smarter uh, a lens. Um, so, uh, and also I wanna agree with Steve that if you have questions, I think any of us are available and would be happy to, to help. I call both of these um, two incredible uh, optometrists often with questions, so. Thank you. And I'll say that there's so many times where we put the diagnostic lens on and it's so close that patients beg me to, can I just take this lens home? You know, can I, it's, you know, so much better than what I had before or so much better than when I came, walked in here today. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's tempting. You know, you just want to say, oh, well, you know, we have to order a lens for you. It's not exactly where we need to be, but just amazing how many times I've, I've gotten that with this, with this lens for sure. That's amazing. That's just great to hear. I think that's just a testament of, you know, the power of data and, and these data driven lenses. So um, that's fantastic. Um, so um, with that, I think, you know, we're coming to the end um, of our webinar, um, which is good because we have about 10 minutes or so, Steve and Suzanne, and, and there are some questions um, in the uh, Q&A uh, panel. So let's just get to them. Um, Dr. Luciano Bastos, I believe he is from Brazil, welcome. Um, do you compensate on other areas like central base curve to maintain the same sag changing uh, the landing zone? Um, I'm gonna start jumpstart with that um, answer and then please chime in uh, both of you with your experience. I would love to hear your experience. So. Um, one of the great things about uh, Boston Sight Lenses, Dr. Bastos, is um, we have the benefit of, of spline curve technology, and that allows us to manipulate the lens design and the parameters independent from one another. 
um, Boston side scleral is a lens design where the base curve is decoupled from the sag. So the base curve in essence, what's doing um, in this design is actually modifying the peripheral cornea into the limbal stone, uh, where if you flatten the base curve, you're increasing that clearance in the periphery. And if you're steepening the base curve, you're, you're decreasing the clearance in that periphery, but then you can adjust the sag independently. And when you raise the sag or lower it, um, that's independent from actually the, the landing zone. So you can have that parameter independent. So um, that's actually a, a real benefit. I actually enjoy that coming into clinic um, and offering post treatment for my patients at Boston side. What has been your experience, Steve and, and Suzanne? Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I would agree. And I also think when you're first fitting or even now for me, changing multiple parameters at the same time, um, it complicates things because you don't know what works and what's not working. Or oftentimes you create your own new problem, you know, when we're trying to go for perfection, right? So taking it one step at a time I and mean, that one change, not causing everything else to change is actually a lot of, it gives you a ton of good information. Um, so I actually think this is a huge benefit of the lens. That's wonderful. Um, there's a question, uh, same uh, Dr. Bostas as well. What are the difference between daily wear and uh, sleeping time? Uh, I know you commented on that, uh, Suzanne. Um, uh, please chime in and then I can also chime in uh, yeah. afterwards. So I think that's a tricky question. Um, in the literature, there is not much data about this. Um, there are some, I think, one or two case reports, and it might even be from Boston site. Karen probably wrote them. Um, so I have I have looked into this uh, a significant amount. Um, what I would tell you is uh, you have to walk before you run with these patients. Um, you slowly build up to make sure their corneas can tolerate it. Um, in my case, I'm very lucky that I am co-managing them with either an ocular oncologist or a cornea specialist on the floor with me. Um, and we don't start this way. We start with building up the wear time during the day. And we always ask that they have, you know, at least an hour of time off. I know this is very hard for some of these patients. Um, and now I'm, I, this is not uh, evidence proof or research based, but I personally am in favor of having a different lens for night and day, or just having two separate ones. So you can really do a thorough cleaning when the other lens is off. But um, there isn't a tremendous amount of literature about this. And I think Stephen and Karen um, can agree. Um, I do have a handful of patients doing it and doing it well, but these are also um, people that I, we watch very closely. Yeah, I, I think that's the key. So I think it's important to, to note that in the United States, um, so these designs um, are clear by the FDA and, and the clearance is, is actually for daily wear. Um, like everything in healthcare, medicine, uh, optometry, when we practice and, and we manage our patients, um, we have to do so understanding what are the um, approvals, but sometimes uh, these practices, something that Dr. Sherman has uh, shared, uh, these would be considered off-label uses of these lenses. And oftentimes, you know, the way we, we, we do this in our clinic, there's an informed consent process where we educate the patient about the benefits and risk and, and the patient agrees to move forward. And I think that the, the key, um, obviously, uh, besides educating the patient, is what Dr. Sherman is saying. Um, knowing that this is off-label uses, sometimes these patients with ocular surface diseases, they just um, need this. They've tried other alternatives and this is what they need. Um, the key is that you have to do this very judiciously and monitor these patients so closely because obviously um, there is a risk uh, for infection when we have patients sleeping with lenses. And if we do so, obviously the management and care that we take um, is uh, hopefully, you know, obviously geared towards preventing um, and mitigating those risks. And I think, Suzanne, that's why um, I totally appreciate what, what you're saying when you're saying that you're co-managing these patients um, in, in the medical center where, where you practice. We, we have the fortune to do the same thing in our practice with our um, corneal specialist. So I hope this answers the question, uh, Dr. Bastos. Thank you for joining uh, from Brazil. Um, 
Dr. Babascus, who's actually joining from Ecuador, uh, welcome as well. Um, he's asking, um, should we always orient these lenses when we apply them at 12 o'clock? Um, or is it not necessarily the case? If you guys wanna chime in and, and I can add um, anything in the end if needed. You don't have to when you when you insert them. Um, we, if you look at actually the fit kit of Boston Sight, the manual, it's actually laid out really nicely. It will show you that the lenses have dots on them. The right one has one dot and the left one has two. And actually it also has an inscription that tells you, you know, it says the patient's initials and, and um, what lens diameter. Um, and it'll show you the normal pattern of where the lens ends up. Um, and these lenses tend to go to around the same place um, most of the time. So truthfully, no. And in my opinion, I think this is actually a really good thing because the patients have enough to worry about when they're learning to put on a scleral lens for the first time. Um, so getting it in at the exact dot on the exact spot um, doesn't have to be so stressful. And when we do our evaluation, I always mark in the chart exactly where that dot is because that's very helpful. And it's actually necessary when you're doing any changes to the uh, to the haptics. You need to know where that dot is because you need to know where the one, two, three, and four are so you can adjust those particular parameters. So I think you added- So, uh, you know, Karen- you think, Yeah. I say, when Karen had mentioned about independently changing, um, you know, the different parameters, you could also independently change, you know, all or one of those four, uh, you know, quad haptics. That's right. So Boston Size Sclera is a quadrant specific design. Um, and they are what Dr. Sorkin was alluding to, I think is a very good um, uh, thing to, to highlight, is the fact that all the meridians are engraved with a very simple uh, numeric system, one, two, three, or four. So um, regardless of where the dot is, um, you if the lens is aligned, um, you can see where the, um, if there's a haptic that you need to change, uh, either steepen or flatten, you would go to Fit Connect. There's some graphical representations that would guide you um, as to what changes to make in those haptics. Um, you just find the numbering system in that haptic, that laser engraving. Um, and that indicator would tell you which meridian you have to modify. Um, in our clinic, we do let patients know to orient with the dots. Um, at top, um, you know, it depends on, you know, your preference. We, we do recommend, you know, start them with the dots at the, at the top and the lenses, as Dr. Sherman was saying, they're going to find their place. Usually they, they sit kind of in a bleak manner. Um, but um, as Dr. Sherman was saying, if for some reason the dot does not land in the superior portion, let's say it lands in the inferior portion, and that's the scleral shape of your patient, uh, the beauty about this numbering system is that if the lens is stable, it's not rotating, and the haptics are actually aligned in that manner, and maybe you just need to modify one haptic or the other, again, you just refer to that um, number that is engraved in the haptic, that will tell you which haptic, which meridian you need to change and by, how, by which amount, and then you would do that in Fit Connect. So that's a very good question. Um, uh, Steven and Suzanne, um, how do you use topography given that the algorithm that Suzanne just explained, it's not based on a calculation, it's not based on, on base curve, on topography, basically, um, the way to fit Boston size scleral is once you choose your diameter, then you just go to the standard scleral shape. This is based on data. Um, and then uh, from there, I think that's why Suzanne, you probably haven't had the need to go to a steep scleral shape or flat scleral shape. Um, but then if you do, then you just go to the right or left of the set. And so um, there's a question here. So how do you use topography? Um, if at all, to guide um, your fittings, to help you understand what you're going to do with your patient? Uh, I will say, you know, we have, you know, we're very lucky that we have the Pentacam, we have tomography um, in the practice. I don't rely on it heavily anymore. Um, I find that everything I need, I can learn from just doing a side profile 
not everything, but most things I can learn from doing a side profile view of the patient and from putting this diagnostic lens on. So I think my fits would be very similar even without the topography or tomography. It is helpful and it tells you the the irregularities and it shows you different things and it helps you know maybe if um, the visual center or the optical center is probably gonna be inferior, but um, it doesn't lead me personally in which lens I pick. Um, And I don't use, I don't rely heavily either on OCTs um, with my lenses. Now, I will tell you in the beginning, I did a lot more, but um, the more you eyeball it and the more you do um, time and and everything, uh, I find that I don't need to rely on the uh, the topography or tomography as much. So I like having it. um, And when I work with my technician, who is my right hand fabulous, I know she references it. She always takes note of the, high, the steepest point. She always takes note of the flattest point. And for her, it gives her a guidance of where to begin. But I personally don't um, use it significantly. I agree. Okay. You know, what I would say, you know, for me, um, I would agree with you, but we use it more as a general guidance. For example, if, if it's a very steep uh, protruded cornea, what that would help me is to then choose perhaps to go to a larger diameter for the reasons that you described so uh, beautifully, Suzanne, you know, just for weight distribution and avoid, you know, compression over time. We actually have um, an attendee from Lisbon, uh, Dr. Rodolfo Moura, who I actually met uh, last weekend. Uh, Thanks for joining, Rodolfo. Uh, It's so nice to see you uh, join the webinar. And Um, You're absolutely right in your comment and question, Rodolfo. Um, You know, it's, we do orient uh, the lenses, as I said, you know, it's it's advisable to to tell them to orient the lenses at the top and then they'll find um, their um, position. And then from there, then you just go find the numbers and um, uh, engrave them the haptics and modify from there. We'll take one last question. We're a little bit um, close to um, time, if not a little bit past, but I think this is um, a good question that I think it's good to end with. Um, Dr. Gear, I hope I hope I'm, I'm saying your name correctly. Um, she or he, I'm sorry, um, suggestions for fitting eyes with filtering blebs. Do you um, go smaller? Um, do you go larger over it? Um, do you use a channel? Um, can you both speak about your perspective, um, how you approach these anatomical elevations? Yeah. Now, I, I was, go ahead, Steve. I was going to say, I think it really depends on the, the anatomy and the location and the size and if an overhanging bleb or if it's a small, you know, nodular one, I mean, location closest to limbus or, or where and how wide it is. I think that really depends on, on that, th- those factors. I would say, you know, with fitting a, a bleb and most of the patients that I think I'm fitting who have blebs are usually in pretty bad shape. Um, you have to weigh the risks and, and the benefits of them wearing a lens. Um, so I have a couple of monocular patients who have blebs wearing a scleral lens. Um, it is very challenging to fit a really small diameter scleral lens with a patient with a bleb, depending on what Steve just said, where the bleb is, is it closer to limbus? Is it hanging over or not? Um, because the last thing you want is any mechanical rubbing of the lens, um, to erode it or to cause damage to the bleb. Um, I have used a channel before on a bleb, um, but my level of comfort and um, I watch that patient much more carefully than any of these other patients I've I've mentioned. Um, And so I think that that's where we come into prose lenses. I think that's where we come into impression molding lenses, maybe even using um, um, scleral, uh, what am I trying to say here? Um, the free form topography. Scleral, 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 scleral. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, I think these is, in my opinion, and, and, and just mine, these are the ones I'm, I'm very careful about, because the bleb, you know, having that surgery done is, is pretty intense, it changes the shape of the cornea, um, and, and doing anything to harm it. And that is a very good example of a patient who does have to insert their lens at the exact place that we asked them to. Um, what my response was not correct for that kind of patient. Um, I'm talking about somebody who doesn't have any lumps or bumps and you're not using channels. Um, and I don't think notching is really used as significantly. Actually, I remember hearing Karen speak in like 2017 at GSLS about, about notching. Do you remember that? Um, up on the stage and being so, um, and so impressed by, uh, she admitted to what we thought was right and what we realized wasn't right. Um, which I think in scleral lenses, you know, in any, any lenses, we, uh, Steve and I presented three or four cases that went well, but they don't all go well. Um, uh, and I actually have a blood patient that ended up failing after being fit um, in a scleral. So I say, I think that you have to use, um, you work, you co-manage it with their glaucoma specialist, um, someone like Karen or Manny or any of the other fitters is probably a great um, resource for this, but it has to be the right bleb at the right location and, um, probably very flat and small. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. So, I mean, smart channels are great because you can bolt over them. And I would agree with you. We have to monitor these patients and check the pressure and, and function. Sometimes with the notching, <laughs> uh, um, many people do notching and, and notching can be a great outcome. But what I would urge all of you to be mindful of is that at times or sometimes um, when we uh, make notches, the lens sometimes tends to decentered in the direction of the notch. So if you're notching um, for something that relies on its function, like a bleb, and the lens decenters around that area, it could start to impinge on that uh, filtering bleb and may have an impact on its function. So um, this is why it's good to, to get all these education and, and, and attend these webinars so that we can learn um, how to manage and, and troubleshoot these cases. So this is what I would say about notching. And this would be a great application for smart channels, which is one other questions from our, our, our users. So with that, if there's questions that we were not able to get to because of time, um, we will make sure to follow up uh, when we send the recording for the webinar. And um, we hope to address the remaining questions. But I really thank all of the attendees for joining. It's such a pleasure to see that we have uh, attendees literally from all over the world. Um, this is a global community. And um, before thanking our um, great speakers tonight, I do wanna invite all of you uh, to join our global community. We have a Facebook fit group page called Boston Size Scleral Fit Group. Um, we're also on Instagram. You can follow us at Boston Size Sclero. We're, um, especially in the fit group page, we share so many cases, uh, tons of pearls, tips, um, and it's, it's a forum for all of us to share um, and um, learn from each other. So I invite you to join if you're not part of it. And with that, um, thank you so much, Dr. Sherman, Dr. Steve Sorgan. What a treat, uh, really. It's been such a pleasure um, uh, to collaborate with you. Boston Side is grateful for your participation. I'm sure the attendees um, learned so much from you both. So thank you so much. Have a great night. And we will see you at the next Boston Side Scleral Practitioner Learning Series. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>